Hello, and thanks very much for joining this event. Um, it is the second in a series of five events this week that is built around the theme of the new issue of The Philosopher, which is the journal that organizes these events. So this is the latest issue. And as you can see, the theme is, what is we? So the, um, so the, the series of events this week tries to look at that question in from a number of different perspectives. So yesterday we had um, Ragini through us through Navasanam Brooke Holmes looking at what is we in terms of questions around education and the fundamental nature of collectives, notions of division. Tomorrow we're looking at it in the context of loneliness with a historian, Faye Bound Alberti, and a philosopher, Lars Svensson. Later in the week, we're looking at it in the context of the nature of public discourse, the fractious nature of discourse. I'm thinking about the question of getting along with each other, obviously a very relevant question. And then the weekends with more of a phenomenological perspective, looking at you know fundamental questions of how is a, a we formed, how is it separate from an I, the nation, the interconnection between self and other individuals and groups. Tonight, we're looking at the notion of universality and specifically in the work of Todd McGowan, who is a theorist, often, you know, specifically in relation to film, but these days um, I think he's pretty much free to theorize about anything. So he recently wrote a book called Universality and Identity Politics, published by Columbia University Press, and Todd contributed a piece for the new issue called um, Universal, well, it's called the same thing as the event tonight, um, which is the universality of non belonging. So, we're going to look into those terms what is universality, what is non belonging, and how do these link in with questions about our political futures? So, as I said, Todd's based at University of Vermont, where he's a film theorist, he's very widely published. Um, you may have seen books of his on David Lynch, for example. Um, he wrote a book on Hegel last year in relation to politics and emancipation. And as I said, he's written the new book on universality and identity politics. I'm delighted that he's joined in conversation um, for this event by Jana Bacevich, who's an assistant professor in the um, sociology department at Durham, which is nice because it means she's just moved up the road from me where I'm based in Newcastle. So we can hang out every so often and she's a member of the editorial board of the philosopher and she will definitely be contributing quite a lot to the philosopher next year I, I wrote down some I mean Jana actually seems to research a hell of a lot of things but the thing that kind of leapt out at me is she focuses on the meaning use and ontological status of concepts and so um, in addition to that she's looking at the social production of knowledge and so she's going to be contributing a piece next week on the um, next year on the division between the lay expert division, which is obviously a big question around expertise, ignorance and various things. So um, I think Todd and Jana have a lot of very similar ground. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So I'll stop nattering now um, and hand over to Jana and Todd. Just a couple of very brief things like I'll be sending a few things to the chat function and please feel free any sort of comments or links or anything send it there, but if you'd like a question asked, please send it to the Q&A, which is also at the bottom of your screen and please keep the questions reasonably short because obviously it's easier to read a short question than a very long one. But anyway, I think that's everything. So I hand it over to Todd and Jana and really hope that everyone who's tuned in will enjoy this event. Right. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, hello, Todd. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Jana, and I'm thrilled that we will be discussing uh, two among my favorite concepts tonight, uh, and that is universality and non-belonging and in a non-mutually exclusive mode. Um, as Anthony has mentioned, uh, Todd has written a, a fantastic and very, very interesting essay uh, that's come out in the most recent issue uh, of the philosopher that engages with those those two terms and their relation um, and also um, has a book that uh, elaborates 
on the relationship between these two terms uh, and their potential uh, political futures. So Todd, you started by saying that uh, universality or universalism have had uh, historically quite a bit of bad press, uh, both in politics and in philosophy. Uh, but one of the things we've seen as of very recently is uh, that there seems to um, be a renewed call for, for universality or universalism. As a matter of fact, uh, with Joe Biden's uh, recent victory, uh, I think it's, I think we can safely say victory, oh, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there's been... Um, he at least has been adamant about calling for unity and uh, the vice president Kamala Harris has um, called for a series of sort of rather universalistic sounded, sounding terms such as hope, unity, decency, science and truth. So does that mean that uh, universality is back in vogue? Uh, I don't know about that. It's interesting because I think Maybe it is, but it seems like to me that they are invoking exactly the wrong kind of universality. And that is, and it's and it's interesting. So the, I think the key term of all the ones you mentioned was actually science, because science is this real, at least in the States, and I think everywhere where there's a populist regime, science is a real, it's it maybe everywhere. Science is a real, it's a it's a word that cuts. And so there are these, I mean, I I play tennis with a woman who's very conservative, but she, she says, why doesn't Trump just accept science? And, and I think it's interesting that, the, that if you're not accepting science, you don't get included in that universal. So I think that this new universalism of Biden, et cetera, I think it's in a certain way, it's, it's still the old, what I would call bad universalism of there's a certain we, and then there's a we because there's a they, and the they are those who don't accept science, I think. I mean, that seems, or don't accept what experts say. And I really feel like this, it's interesting to me that this is a, an issue for you as well. Like this, the question of the expert, I think is really maybe the central question in, in these populist, uh, with populist movements and the, and, the, and the way in which the, the figure will defy the expert. And my sense is even that Trump might have been helped by the pandemic because it gave him this chance to oppose himself to the expert like Fauci and everyone that says you have to wear a mask. And it's interesting in the states, the, the places where there was most of an outbreak of pandemic, there was most support for Trump. There's an exact correlation. So I find that just a fascinating thing. So I guess the, the long and the short of it is I think that, that this universality that Biden is evoking is, is still the bad universality of belonging and not of what I would call non-belonging. That's brilliant, thank you. I was hoping you might say that, but then again, I had to, so I had to um, allow for the possibility that you might have yeah. said, yes, that's it, oh, yeah, uh, we're done, yes, yes. Victor, victory assured. Yeah. Um, so um, I was going to ask you whether you would like to expand a bit on that concept of non-belonging, because to me, it sounds um, almost intuitive, but I say that as someone uh, for whom non-belonging has been sort of a vital part of both my uh, theoretical and political orientation and life as well. As a matter of fact, I actually remembered that the planning of this event started with um, a performative gesture of non-belonging of me asking Anthony to delete the critics from my name because that is a marker of a belonging to an ethnic group that I don't right. particularly belong to. But um, I was wondering um, if you would sort of want to, to say a bit more about what does non-belonging mean for you? So how is it different from say exclusion or margin, well, marginality and so on and so forth? So what is what is this non-belonging about? Yeah, yeah, I'd be interesting to hear what if you agree with what I think of it. Because um, so my idea is that that non-belonging is in a certain way, it's the fate of everyone because I, I, and I, this is the idea I get from Hegel that there's no, because there's no figure that can really, there's no substantial figure that can really ensure your belonging. So there's no way that you can have your belonging guaranteed. There's no recognition that really fully counts and makes you feel like you belong. So there's this, I would say there's a generalized non-belonging, but I don't, I think there, there's a people that disavow their non-belonging and, 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 and strive to belong. And then there are, there's an, you can 
like with taking off the diacritical marks, you can avow, I think, your non-belonging. So I do think there is a, an, there's an element, even though it's a generalized fate, I think, I think there is this element of, of freedom in avowing your own non-belonging. And I think the difference between non-belonging and exclusion is pretty interesting. So Alain Badu makes this, I think, really good distinction between belonging and being a part. And so you can be a and he does it through set theory, which is fine, but I, I don't think it's necessary to do it that way. But his point is that something can be a part of a set, but not belong to the set. And I think that's a really good distinction. So what's excluded would not even be a part. But the point is, and I think this you can see this politically, like the non-belonging actually has, those who don't belong have a necessary role because just like I was talking about with the science question, like the people who belong need those people who don't belong. So in order to create a group of people who believe in science, you need those people who don't believe in science in order to constitute the group of people who do believe as a whole. And I think that, so that gesture is necessary, I think, for belonging, even though you never securely get your belonging through that gesture, it nonetheless is a necessary gesture to get in that, to, to, to create belonging. That's a great point. And it brings me to something that I've been actually wondering about, about the concept itself, which is whether it is more of a state or whether it is more of a practice. So whether it is achieved, which your comment um, to me at least now seems to, or your interpretation seems to suggest, or whether it is a given. And also where does um, agency or specifically political agency lie in that sense. So when we do not belong, do we have a choice to stop not belonging? Or do, uh, does our non-belonging change over time and in relation to what? So who decides, who gets to decide, that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think some people have, some people take up non-belonging, other people have non-belonging thrust onto them. So I think that that's true. But I also think you can strive I think all belonging is striving to belong, right? So, so there's only that striving. There's never a fully, you never fully feel like you get there, which is why you constantly need other sources of recognition because no, there's no recognition that's ever enough so to, to really assure you that you belong. So you constantly need more. But I think to, to, to your first question, which is really great, I think that, but I would, I think you're gonna think this is a cop out, but I think it's both. I think it's on the one hand, a praxis and a state that you're necessarily in, but you can, it can be a praxis when you take it up as a, as a position. Like for instance, I think the great example of this was the summer Black Lives Matter rallies. Like when they would say things like, I, I am George Floyd or, or I can't breathe. These kind of slogans I think are exactly putting themselves in the position of that person who doesn't belong overt like like they make it into a political practice and i and i so i think there so there is a way to actually take it up and i think we've even just that i think that's what's i mean when i was when i wrote the book that hadn't happened yet but it was i mean there was all there black lives matter had happened so there was some of this but the those certain slogans hadn't been developed yet but when they were developed i thought those are really great because they're really affirmations they're not, they're not, I mean, it's interesting. They didn't say like more black police. Like they didn't, nobody said that, right? Like nobody said like more representation. The no, they said black lives matter. I can't breathe, uh, you know, all those kinds of things. I am George Floyd. So I feel like that's a, so that's a way in which it can be a practice. I think that's a really important point in part because it kind of brings me to, to my next question, which is, you do seem to claim that uh, non-belonging or the, the recognition of non-belonging, which I also think is, is a relatively interesting, um, I guess perhaps overlap between concepts that you've got there, is not only important for emancipation, but uh, in your theory sort of central or uh, possibly the most relevant thing for emancipation and that this is actually the path um, to or perhaps through the recognition of universality. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on, on why is non-belonging such an important element of emancipatory politics in your view? Mm 
Yeah, so I, I just, for instance, equality, like I think there's no, I don't think that it's possible to think of equality, universal equality through some kind of inclusion or belonging. And because I think it necessarily implies, as I've said before, some outside, you're, somebody has to be left out. Whereas I think non-belonging does allow us to think a kind of universal equality because we can all be equal in our non-belonging. And I think that's a really, so for me, that political project, and which I think of as the central political project of, I think it's of Marx, of a lot of, I mean, it gets, of Hegel for me, especially. Uh, I think that political, Fanon, I think that's his project. So I think that political project is, is, uh, is really only realizable through non-belonging. So that's why it's really, that's why I, I, I find it central because that's the only way to, it seems to me the only way to save this idea of universal equality, which has been, I understand the critiques of it, the way that it's, it's been precisely for what we were talking about this way in which it's excluded always. There's always been this idea like white men are equal, but the other, you know, everyone else, some are more equal than others, right? Like this famous Orwell line. And I, I think that the, it's only if you, if you, think it that through non-belonging that you get out of that problem, it seems to me. In your book, um, I really liked how you made the point of reclaiming universality as sort of the central driving point of emancipatory politics. And you kind of go on to, to argue or describe how it was actually the interpretation or the wrong kind of interpretation that of universality that, for instance, drove uh, say socialism or communism uh, to um, forms of totalitarian exclusion actually that uh, aimed to or that aimed to integrate in ways that were violent. So that brings me to uh, perhaps one of the things I think our listeners, watchers, participants, audience would probably find uh, quite interesting, which is perhaps to elaborate a bit on the relationship or the difference uh, between this kind of universality and inclusion, because it does seem that you suggest that inclusion tends to uh, go more in the direction of the wrong kind of universality or the universality that actually elevates uh, the particular to the level of the universal, thus erasing all other forms of yeah. non-belonging as well. So kind of stri strives for a totality or strives for total inclusion. Yeah, I think so. The, so to me, the idea of total inclusion, as you just said, I think that's what, that's the way in which these great projects of the, especially the 20th century, but even of, I think I, I talk about the French Revolution a little bit in this way. And I think the French Revolution I find fascinating because you get the, I, and I talk about the, the trajectory of Robespierre and the way in which he early on is, again, I find this the most fascinating. So he's, a, so the, he's against uh, imperial war, not imperial, they wouldn't have been imperial, but war is exporting the revolution because his idea is it can't be exported. Like it's not this thing that we have that we give to others. It's what I think he wouldn't have put it this way, but it's what nobody has. And I think if you, when you're trying to, to include everyone, I think the idea is that you're going to, that and this is just what I've said, that, that you necessarily, there's two things, I think. You necessarily have people that are, there has to be this excluded Part, right it has to be excluded and just like you were saying I think that the inclusion is always going to be violent for those who don't want to be included and I, it's interesting I mean I think the peasantry is really interesting in this light right the peasantry I, I, I was talking with uh, Jean-Claude Milner in, in Paris and he, would, he said this fascinating thing to me he said the left has never been able to correctly apprehend the problem of the peasantry and they always resist every revolutionary gesture and I thought and I'm like, oh, that's too, that's too grandiose. I can't be right. But then I thought about it. I'm like, it's actually completely correct. Completely. I was and say, I was yeah. thinking of the peasants in, in, you know, to resist collective farming in the Soviet Union, of course, uh, that they, they would kill their own, they'd kill their own animals rather than give them over to the collective. And I, I you know, you could imagine farmers in Iowa doing the same thing rather than, you know, signing up for whatever they're going to, uh, you know, kill their, their own their own cattle. And I think that that, so I think the violence of that inclusive gesture is the, is to me, one of the real problems with the project of belonging and of inclusion of making everyone, 
come in and even in the liberal version, which is that's what we talked about in the beginning of Biden articulating, I think even the liberal version has this subtle violence to it. You know, it can't escape it, even though it never, it doesn't want to avow that. I think it has to, I think any project of inclusion has to have this violent, we're going to bring you in. And if you're not going to be willing to come in, we're going to, you're going to be excluded. So that's the, I think that's for me, the real problem with, with the project of inclusion. I was going to say that also brings us to something that's perhaps also um, an underexplored difference. And I think that's the major political import of your book. Um, that's the difference between liberalism and universalism. Yeah. So, um, and I'm guessing this is what readers will probably start thinking about as well. So how is this just not sort of bland liberalism? Well, yeah, I mean, I think in some way liberalism was the occasion for me writing that, like a critique of liberalism is in a certain way the occasion for me writing it because, and I think that for me, the big thing is liberalism starts, it, it's, its fundamental starting point is an atomistic view of the social order. So every, it's first, we, and this is, I think it starts, you can even see it in social contract theory. Like there's an idea that there are these isolated individuals, they come together, through a contract constitute a social order. And I think that a universalist position thinks of it the, exactly the opposite, that first there's a universal and then out of that, there are singulars that appear then individuals, subjects that, that emerge. And so I think that if that, so the, the, the fundamental starting point of thought and the way that you conceive things, like I think liberalism makes that error and I feel like that error is the thing that you can never get to a real universal position if you start from this notion of isolated individuals. It's always going to be a problem for liberalism, I think. So, so for me, and maybe this is too idealist, I think that, that it's a philosophical error on the part of liberalism that leads to the political error. You know, that the that it's almost, you know, there's a conceptual problem, and then that that I mean, I don't know. It, I think it's a difficult question to say which is first, because I think there's a dialectical exchange between the two, like the practice informs the theory and maybe the theory comes out of the practice. I don't, even, I don't really have a, a dog in that fight. I mean, my, my point is just the theory, as long as that theory is there, it's gonna be a barrier to a, concept, a real conception of universality. What about liberal, well, what about multiculturalism actually? So is it, I mean, I, I would assume you would say it is still a barrier and even more so, but would you want to? Uh, yeah, I mean, as a, yeah, I don't necessarily, I, I, I'm not sure, I, people mean so many different things by it. So it's a hard, it's hard to talk about it in, in concrete terms, but I, I do think like that on, on one level, I don't like, I don't think culture is either universal or not. So I don't, it doesn't, I don't, I think multiculturalism is fine. Like, I don't think it's really where the real political fight takes place. So I don't, so it doesn't, I don't think it's worth opposing it or endorsing it. I just think it's, I mean, I almost think it's a sort of fact of life that, that there is multiculturalism. And I don't think, I, I mean, I'm against this notion that one culture is, is a universal culture. I'm absolutely against that notion. So in that sense, I guess I'm multiculturalist, right? But I, but I, but I, I, I don't want to. I don't think that the that culture is where the real fight is takes place, really. Yeah, I meant more sort of historically as a, as a way of reconciling, possibly, or one option uh, of reconciling sort of universalism and particularity or politics of difference. But um, as far as I'm, I don't have a dog in that fight either. And certainly not, uh, not on the side on which most people assume I do. Uh, but that brings me to, to something else. And, and I was also um, thinking about this as, as you were talking about the, the problem of peasantry or uh, the inability to um, integrate uh, peasantry or to integrate the outside uh, mm -hmm. into most, uh, most previous, at least totalizing emancipatory uh, projects. And that's the position from which it is actually possible to not belong. So who can afford not to belong? Because to me, it seems like one of the reasons why the peasants, um, especially in the Soviet Union, had such a hard time. And also I think why the left has, and I would 
absolutely agree with you. Um, historically, has had an issue with uh, understanding uh, the peasantry is because uh, thinkers on the left were actually prone to the same thing, which is to try to assimilate <laughs> the yeah. peasantry onto their own interpretative frameworks, yeah. and the poor peasants uh, to um, to use a slightly cheeky expression somehow always end up on the outside, but uh, actually without being allowed not to belong either to the grand emancipatory projects or to the perhaps somewhat less grand, but still emancipatory projects of, uh, of the left. So what is this? Um, I mean, what about the affordances uh, for non-belonging as a matter of fact? I, what you mean like who can afford to not belong? Yeah. Well. I, I guess I don't. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I guess I don't see it as a. I guess I don't see it that way. I, I guess I see it as it's a it's a it's a position relative to the social order, and so it's not like, you know, like. I, I mean, I think it does. I, I think here's what I would say. I think some people earn too much not to belong. You know, like I think that they're like if you're wealthy, you're there's a kind of symbolic investment that takes place through that, and so you're you're automatically striving to belong solely because of your material conditions. So I guess I would say that there that that that's that would be my point that it's it's not that anyone is is excluded from non belonging i think there's except insofar as you're material in that materially hyper invested in the in the in the project of belonging so i would i think i would see it the other way around like it's more there are certain people that are so it, like like could bill gates ever not belong no he just could never i mean he doesn't belong but could he ever take up the position of non-belonging while he still has his fortune? And it's interesting because he kind of tries, like he kind of, like all this giving away, all this trying to help. And it's interesting, anytime I attack Bill Gates, my students, who, University of Vermont students, they're nice and leftist, they're all, they're fine, but they, but they all get upset. And not all, some, some are, I mean, the socialists don't get upset, but, the, but the, a lot of them, they're good liberal, they just, they are like, Bill Gates is trying to do something really good, what are you doing? This is very common response. And so I think then I just say what I just said that like once you have so much, you're already so invested in the project of belonging that it's very, I would say, you know, it's like uh, uh, it's harder for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for the camel to pass through the eye of a needle, right? Like I think that's uh, my position as Christ uh, Christian on this on this question. Uh, that's a really, really interesting comment because it does bring me to something that um, I think I have been actually saving for for the end. But I might, uh, I might just uh, bring it in now that you've uh, that you've brought Christianity in, and that's a question of well, you know, how do we arrive to this stage in emancipatory politics in which everyone recognizes that they equally do not belong? So, what sort of transubstantiative gesture is there uh, to be taken or to well, what kind of gesture needs to happen? Uh, is it primarily epistemic? Is it uh, revolutionary? Is it both? And in what senses uh, in order for, for non-belonging to actually become uh, a basis for transformative Less yeah, politics. I think it's all. I think it has to be. I think it has to be waged on all these fronts, right? It has so it has to be. So it's both epistemic for sure, but it has to be political for sure. I also think. I mean, this is just probably my bias as a as a theorist of media and uh, literature. Like, I think it has to be aesthetic too. Like, I think there's a way in which attention to aesthetic, uh, aesthetic works can show us that that can really highlight non belonging. And I almost think that the the, the, I have a kind of aesthetic uh, theory that the greatness of the work is how much it uh, forces us to confront our non-belonging. You know, like, so I think Citizen Kane is the greatest film because it's the best film about really just a radical non-belonging of even the person who's at the highest point in the social order. So it's, it's taking the, the, the Bill Gates figure and just showing this utter non-belonging of him. So I don't know. I mean, that's just probably my own bias, but I do think on all the fronts, I think it has that... that and I, I think we're seeing this politically in, at least, I mean, around the world, I think we're seeing this kind of movement. So I'm not, I don't, I don't think a theorist can tell people acting politically what to do. I'm very Hegelian on this question. Like, I think you just learn from 
how people are acting and then you try to make the theory under you know have to try to understand what's going on theoretically but i don't think you can tell like I, oftentimes people will say to me like well what what should we do and i'm like I, what do i know i don't know anything i'm just trying to understand what it is that's happening you know so i think i don't think theory can say like we need, need to do xyz i just don't think it can do that i think it you know hegel's famous line from preface to philosophy of right the owl of minerva takes flight only with the falling of dusk and i think i really believe that so so i don't know that i but i do think it has to be all these different arenas that that you talked about yeah that's uh that's great and i actually uh i really appreciate that point because uh one of the perspectives that we share is that sort of the theory in and of itself can can really not do much uh yeah. and so, certainly not as much as it as it as it uh, would like to pretend it can um, and I, re um, I was reminded of, uh, you, you made a point, uh, the point about aesthetics, about film theory, and for those of you who have not, uh, not yet uh, read uh, Todd's essay, uh, you bring in Heathers, the film, yeah. and that was, that was actually hilarious for me because I hadn't thought about that film in probably, well, certainly longer than 20 years time. Mm. Another film that that brought to mind uh, was actually The Breakfast Club. Yeah. And I thought that was another example where non-belonging in a manner of in a manner of speaking uh, also kind of involves mutual recognition. So it is a constitution of in a manner of speaking an alternative order uh, through realization of sort of equality of exclusion or yeah. equality of non-belonging as yeah. a matter of fact. I, I, I absolutely agree. I, I, I love Breakfast Club too. I mean, look, the whole, I think the chief problem, and I think this is a problem with Heathers as well, but I think it's more a problem with Breakfast Club, is the way that it's totally white, right? That, 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 that there is this kind of, they're able to make, and, and even the final gesture of Breakfast Club, which I love, is, a, is the black power gesture on the middle of the football field by Jonathan Bender. So it's, it's, and it's, it's, it's so conspicuous that there are no black characters in the film or no non-white characters and but nonetheless i think it's still able to do what you describe and it's it seems like a and i think i often talk about it in talks because i think it's really that i mean heather's people know a little less but i think heather's is slightly more radical and and although you you kind of made me think like oh maybe i'm not right about that but but uh, uh and maybe we can talk about it in a little bit but um but i think breakfast club is pretty great too for that exactly what you're saying it's like a community of non-belonging forms and there's even this moment it's a great moment where they're sitting around and the two popular kids they're like well if we came up to you talking to you and said oh we're all one now or we're all we're all a group and if you were among your friends you would you would say like get you maybe say okay but then behind our back you would and then the two unpopular kids say well we would never do that and then they said and then the popular kids say well, that's because your friends would think it was great that and then they're like that's so and then and then they that's a moment and then they kind of get beyond that moment to say like i have to give up even that thing that i was attached to so i mean of course the film ends on saturday afternoon and we don't see what happens at school the next day uh but i i kind of like i mean i think it's a very it's a great film of, it's interesting how many teen films are about the importance of non-belonging and they, they kind of flirt with the opposite of characters striving to belong and then they end up with this affirmation of non-belonging at the end and exactly it's it's the affirmation that i'm particularly interested in and whether it can i mean i'm sure it can also be sort of read as a as a gesture of political neutralization and we are getting by the way quite a few questions so i'm just going to sort of come come to the last thing that i wanted to raise and i think it addresses specifically the question of accommodation uh, which is the one thing you don't really talk um, about in your book is the question of justice. So what happens if we approach non-belonging from a position in which there is a need to somehow readjust or recognize that uh, not everyone has equally uh, non-belonged in the past, so to speak. So in the sense of, you know, I, I was wondering along the lines of, well, it, it's, it's fine to say that uh, everyone is equally always on the outside or everyone is always on the outside in some ways. Uh, 
but um, you know, everybody hurts, but not everyone hurts other people. Right. And not everyone has hurt other people. So how would we accommodate or how would we adjust the uh, account of non-belonging for purposes of redistribution or any kind of more radical notion of justice? And I think that's, uh, that brings us back to, to, I guess, the sort of the starting or the opening discussion, which is whether the promise of unity and the promise of reconciliation can anyhow address past injustices or do we just have to sort of um, <laughs> get along and move on? Well, no, it's a great question, but I do think that the, I, I mean, for me, the equality of non-belonging means that economic justice as well. So I think that that, so I, 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 I mean, I, you can't have like everyone doesn't belong, but some people get to live in mansions and other people get to live in slums. I mean, that just doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. So I, I, so I think there needs to be a radical like expropriation of the expropriators, if that's, you know, to use the old kind of Marxist language. So I, I don't, I don't, I, I, I have no pro. I think that it's absolutely necessary. So I think any kind of notion of equality has to include, to, you know, taking back what's been stolen, basically. So I, I, I don't have. I think that's a, that there has to be some. I mean, the only thing I would say is that, that if you believe in universal non-belonging, then you don't see that person that's being ex, that ha you have to bring to justice as the enemy. I, that's all. That's all I would say. Like they need to be. Like there still needs to be some radical equalizing, but it doesn't, it's not, you don't view them as this enemy that we can get rid of and then everything will be harmonious. That's that, which I think has been a problem historically for the left. That's all, that's all I would say. But other than that, I think definitely we need some kind of like appropriation of that which has been stolen from, from people. That's fantastic. And I think I'm going to stop abusing <laughs> my, uh, my privilege of belonging uh, to a small group of panelists uh, for this event and uh, start including questions from the audience. So we have quite a few quite interesting questions. I'm just going to um, scroll down quickly. Uh, one that I thought uh, would be uh, interesting for us to sort of start from is from Inke Brumer, who is asking um, to abbreviate, uh, I always thought about non-belonging uh, as a feeling. So, and especially when we take power structures um, into account uh, where not everyone is um, accepted as equal, can we actually, I'm paraphrasing now, uh, can we actually talk uh, talk about in the same way about the feeling of non-belonging? I guess I, I I'm curious to hear what you think. I I don't I don't view it as a feeling so much. Like I view it as a structural position. And so to me, how how you feel about it, I don't. I mean, I, I it matters for you for a person personally. But I don't think in terms of the political question, I don't think how you feel is as important as the structural position that that is evinced. So that's, I, I don't know, that's what I would, that's how I would respond. I think to me the interesting, I mean, the, the, there's sort of this in-between uh, in um, term which might be helpful here. I'm not always uh, such a big fan of it and that's the structure of feeling. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, whether, um, you know, whether belonging or non-belonging also depends on effective structures of a particular society, place, time, whatever. So whether whether there is something to be said about that. So whether- Right, right. Yeah, I didn't think of that, but that's a good, I think that's a good point. Like the, even the feeling is structured, right? Like that's the point, I think, yeah. And yeah. it's also about that structures do, in a manner of speaking, have effective valence or right. perhaps effective agency so effective productivity so to speak so and i think if we would view belonging or non-belonging also as effective which to me certainly makes i mean it makes intuitive sense which right. isn't obviously saying that we should accept it as such but it is probably saying that we should take or at least seriously consider if we do not <laughs> or if we choose not to um, then it does make sense to perhaps think about how uh, certain forms of belonging or non-belonging are made more likely or easier for some populations 
um, or for in some places and, and so on and so forth. Right, I think that's definitely true. Like certain people have a, like, I, I, I think this is tied to what I said in, toward the beginning that some people are thrust into non-belonging and then some people like they're, they're, they're almost born into this striving for belonging, I think. So I do think that, I think that's right. And so that, you're right that that has to be tied. There has to be an effective structure tied to that. Um, Tonya Stevens is asking, why would we aspire to non-belonging? So why would we, why would we want to know? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, like, belonging. what's the, what's the, what's the value added, right? Like, what's the, like, doesn't belonging seem so much better? And I think the answer is that, that I think neurosis, as Freud describes it, is precisely the striving for belonging, right? So, so, so there's a kind of suffering tied to this striving for belonging that, 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 that is impossible to avow as satisfying. So I think, I don't think there's any escape from suffering, but I think there's a way to find one's suffering, satisfaction in one's suffering. And I think as long as you're striving for belonging, you miss that. So I think in a way it's, it's saying to avow one's non-belonging is a way to avow one's mode of satisfaction rather than trying to always seek something else. Like the, and that's why belonging is constantly committed to, I have to always try to get more and more and more to make sure that I belong. So it's, it's basically a, a structure of, of uh, it's continual dissatisfaction. Mm. I think um, uh, we have quite a few interesting questions about communities. So I'm going to try to, to paraphrase those as well. Um, one is Nicholas Smart, who's asking if we are not uh, independent individuals, but rather interdependent parts of a shared community, uh, always surrounded by others. Do we not then by definition belong uh, to that community, or are we just, so to speak, simply uh, parts of that community? So whether, and I'm, that this is me now expanding on that question, uh, does that not automatically mean that um, our feeling of belonging is also structured by that part, well, that fact, I guess, which goes back to, to our, well, one of our original discussions about whether it's a state or a praxis. Right, right. Uh, and there's also uh, an interesting question from, from um, Alex, uh, who's asking uh, what would a community based on non universal non-belonging uh, look and feel like, which I think, I mean, especially this, the second thing is, is to me quite interesting. Yeah, I love that question. Um, so just about the, about the, um, about the problem of, of um, of, of how you could, sorry, I just forgot the question. So paraphrase the first question again, because I, I was thinking about my answer to the second one. And I forgot. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I think the first question was, aren't we oh, yeah, al already yeah. in, already belonging, yeah. whether we yeah. choose not to yeah. or, or yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I, I just think that I, I could give a, I mean, my answer is a little technical. So my, my point would be, so there's, this is an idea both in Hegel and both and in Lacan. And I think it's pretty, I think it's, so the idea is that there, so in Hegel, his idea is that every substance is, is also a subject. So that means there's no substantial authority that can grant me belonging. And Lacan's idea is that he says the big other does not exist. So there's no, there's no social, there's no authority that can assure me that I belong. So no matter what the community is, even if it's a community, a local community, there always has, there's nothing that could make you sure that you belong. So there's nothing to assure belonging. So the, the community is all, your, your belonging is never assured. So even if you feel like you're part of the community, there's a, in order to assure yourself that you belong, you're, there's this constant striving involved. So, and then, which means that I think that, that I think is also the answer to my other, the other question, which, which would be, I think that the, the, the community of non-belonging is a way to get rid of that constant striving to belong and constantly striving to get more recognition than what other people have. So I think it's a way to kind of, uh, to jump out of that constant struggle for more. Whether, I mean, the more is, you know, it can be more commodities or it can be more money. It can be more just recognition. So I think that would be my idea of a community of non-belonging is that it, like the, and maybe this is impossible to totally get rid of, which is why I think, it's never this perfect community that, that, the, that the fracture is part of it. 
that it'd be a community where recognition didn't count for anything. Like it didn't matter to you whether you got recognized or not because that wasn't the basis of your subjectivity or the connection to other people. So I think that's, that for me is really, is really important, but I think, I don't think that's ever, you know, I don't think you ever fully get that. Now, what I do wonder is, and I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in here though, is whether that would be a community at all. So would we have right. the right to call that a community at all? Yeah, I, I, I think that's an open question. Like, I'm not sure, I tend not to use the word community because for, for yeah. I think the reason that you're suggesting, because I don't really, I find it, I find it always is a way of disavowing the, the necessary cut or lack or, or fracture within any group. And so I think community always makes it seem like, I mean, I think this is probably unfair, but I always link community and kumbaya. And so I always think <laughs> like there's too much of a false wholeness to it. So I don't know, but but yeah, I've had, I, I, I once went to a, a conference on community and I, my paper was entitled why there is no such thing as community. And I thought maybe that's a little perverse, but I, I don't know, I, I do feel like I have a problem maybe the same one you do, I think probably the same one you do with the ev evocation of community, but maybe you can, re I mean, I've had people say, but I'm rethinking it in this other, and then, okay, maybe. So I don't know, I just think it's open for me. I'm, I don't know. Uh, that uh, connects to one of the first questions I've, I've spotted, spotted in the Q and A, and I've been sort of saving it uh, for, for a bit later, which is, um, rose colored glasses is asking does not belonging actually depend so not belonging actually depend on the full universal hegemony against which it acknowledges that it itself does not belong so is it primarily re reactive or parasitic I think it's primary I think it's primary so I think what's primary is non belonging and then what's parasitic on non belonging is the attempt to create a, a a form of belonging. So I think I would just reverse it totally, even though it seems like, well, wait a minute, it's not, it has to be secondary or parasitic, but no, I think it's actually that first we're in, a, we're, we're united in our non-belonging and then we attempt to create groups to which we can belong to escape what, because I think there's an, there's a trauma to non-belonging and I think belonging promises respite from the trauma. And that's why people I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think people uh, seek it out. So I, but I think it's absolutely primary. So I would, I would just kind of reverse that. Uh, we have a couple of questions addressing um, the question of alienation or the relationship between alienation and, and non-belonging. And uh, I definitely like to, to be able to bring, bring those in too. So if it's okay with you, I'll just ask them together and then we can kind of revisit them in sequence if, if need be. So one is James Wands is uh, who's asking how is alienation different? Uh, so what's the relationship between mm -hmm. concepts of alienation and um, non-belonging? And one is from Alex uh, who says, I worry that privileging non-belonging may serve to legitimate social structures that create alienation. So if alienation is universal, doesn't this um, hamstring our critical capacities to change the society? Yeah, I think, well, I mean, I think it just depends on how you define alienation, right? So maybe I'll just define it and then, and then we can see whether it's, so I think there are two forms of alienation, right? So there's the alienation described by Hegel and Freud, I went to put them together, uh, which is our alienation in language. So our are this divide of our subjectivity based upon the fact that we're speaking subjects. So that, and that kind of alienation, I don't think is, um, I think that's linked to non-belonging, but I wouldn't say that it is non-belonging. But then Marx's notion of alienation seems to me to be something that is, is it, it, it's, it's almost, I think I would almost put it this way, that it's almost like it, it comes on top of non-belonging, right? Like it's, it's, it's this added, it's this added, uh, it's what's added to non-belonging that reinforces it. And so I don't think, I would never want to celebrate that kind of alienation. So I think in a way that alienation emerges through the failure to confront non-belonging in the first place. So I don't think it's like, it's a way of saying we can't fight against that because I think avowing non-belonging is precisely 
how one fights against that, against that, that kind of the alien, like our, my alienation in the commodity that I produce, for instance, what Marx would say. So that kind of alienation, that's exactly what I think avowing non-belonging fights against rather than naturalizes. I don't think it's, I don't think it's naturalizing that at all. Like, I think it's, it's saying like that, that get that what's producing this, this flight from non-belonging. It's one of the things that is in flight from it is capitalist society. So I think capital society and the alienation that it produces is, is part of the flight from universality because capitalism is, is the society of the particular. And it, I think this is really important that if you don't see yourself as an isolated particular, you cannot function as a capitalist subject. So I think that is a really crucial thing. And I think everything in capitalist ideology is, is like, think of yourself as a particular, think of yourself as a particular. And one of the ways this works practically is the creation of debt. Like the more you become an indebted figure, the more that you can't see the connect, the possibilities for collective action, because you're just so focused on your individual debt. I know, I personally, I know how this works. Like it's, 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 it's it, you're, you're overcome by it. You can't do anything else. And I think that's part of the way in which the practice of capitalism produces this really particularist mindset. It's really interesting to reflect on how populist politics actually offers, in a manner of speaking, a uh, cure for that. So by actually obliterating or obliterating the sense of uh, the isolation or the alienation um, in debt, uh, or as an individual who, who can only be or who can only attain uh, recognition through actually the the commodity forms so in that sense i think it would actually be quite quite interesting to sort of uh, reflect on that i think that's a such a great it's a great point right like that's the appeal of populism like it gives you this collective that you feel like you can belong to and capitalist relations of production right like like that's why it seems like it's got to be so much better than socialism or like this is what trump throughout the campaign just they're socialists, they're communists, blah, blah, blah. And, and the appeal is, we'll give you, I mean, this is, it's interesting because, I mean, Hitler is just explicit about it, national socialism, right? Like, we're going to give you the bond, but we're going to give you, we're going to, I mean, it's a, it's a, we're going to give you some of these other things to, to ameliorate this utter particularist logic of capitalism. So I think that's such a, I think it's such a great point. I really, I mean, I really like the point that you that you make about uh, Hitler and national socialism. In part, also through through the analysis in your book about actually that and uh, the Holocaust in particular as a uh, as an onslaught on the universal, rather than as a sort of a, a, an onslaught on the particular, as as it has been read by by a number, uh, quite a substantial number of theorists. So as I mentioned, um, I think not by Anna Arendt, I know, as, we, a, yes, as a matter of fact, yes. but uh, yes. it, it, it is a, it is a, a rather um, individualistic hill I'm willing to, to die on. Uh, but to go back to, to the question of the sort of universal and non-belonging, um, what does, how does that bode for um, the future of non-belonging? So from today's perspective, what would we say would, you know, are capacities for non-belonging better now than they used to be? Has anything changed or are they worse? Because I mean, capitalism seems uh, alive, alive and kicking, so to speak. Yeah, I think, but I think what's better is that we have these failures of this bad universalism of the 20th century behind us. And so I think with that, I, I, I don't wanna to be too sanguine because I think the planet's burning up, so it's hard to be too sanguine, but, but I do think, and I also think that the, the ecological movement has a kind of, that there is a way in which non-belonging has a really important role. And then that, that movement really makes it evident. Uh, I mean, there's, I think there is this, you can see the perversion of it in this, the whole earth is one, and that's a, there's a kind of way to create belonging out of that. And would, but I don't think most people do that. Like I think like Greta Thunberg, I don't think does that. I think she's very, it's very much a kind of politics of non-belonging. So I feel like there are, I think in that sense, I think it's, it's for those two reasons. So the, the response to ecological crisis and the fact that that what I would call bad universalist project of, of communism is 
behind us, I think. I think those two things are, bode well for this politics or, or philosophy of non-belonging. I do think though, and this is again, sort of brings me, brings me back to, to the question of justice, which is, and I mean, quite a few environmental justice activists have actually uh, criticized these, also the Anthropocene narrative precisely from this perspective, which is, you know, it's not as if we are all in this together in that sort of way. So um, I think it does leave the question of, well, how do we deal with the sort of inequalities or past injustices, past slights of non-belonging, so to speak, or how do, how do we uh, adjust for the fact that uh, some people have non-belonged differently than yeah. others, so to speak. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I agree. I think I don't, I don't disagree with that. I think that has to be part of the project. Yeah, that there has to be this kind of, I mean, I don't think that adjusting for particular difference is anti-universalist. Like, I just don't think there, I don't see a contradiction in that. Like, I think that's perfectly fine within universal, a universal program. You have, obviously there are in individual particular differences that have to be adjusted. And I, I, don't, that, I don't think that refutes the universal and I don't think universalism excludes that as a possibility. I think it's a, it's a great thesis and uh, possibly a good note to sort of start winding to a close because I'm, I'm aware of the fact that Anthony has already sent uh, details about the uh, forthcoming, well, tomorrow's event to the chat, which uh, I'm taking also to be a sign that we should probably uh, start winding up. Uh, let me just go uh, briefly through the rest of the questions to see if there's something in particular that um, I have missed. Um, I don't think so. Uh, there's a question from Mark Carrigan who's asking, what is, if theory can't help us decide what to do, uh, what is it that political theory contributes to our common life? Well, I think it, it, the whole point of it is to let us know where we stand. I think that's what I would say. Like it, it, and, and understand the, the limits on what we can do. I think that's one thing that it does. It points, out the, it points out where we stand, the limits on what we can do, and can see, I think the theory can see where we go awry. I think that's I don't know, to me, that's one of the most important functions of it, to see where we're going awry and to see, and to, to, to hold certain, like, like Hegel's, I think his entire theoretical project is to say, there's no political structure that's gonna escape contradiction. So however we think of politics, that has to be kept in mind. So I think that's a, that seems like a really good contribution and not just, it's not slight, it's not nothing, but it's not, it's not laying out what the political, he's not saying like, oh, you have to have a, uh, you know, some kind of democracy or some kind of, like, he doesn't say that. So, it's, he's, so that's what I would say. You can't lay out exactly what it's, it can't be like, you know, Fourier or whatever, some kind of like, you know, the houses have to be this far apart. I just don't think theory has that kind of, that kind of role, but I think its role is nonetheless absolutely vital. And that also connects to the last question I'm going to read out, and that's Jacques Ray, who says, if everyone reaches non-belonging, does that mean everyone would belong? Great question. Uh, no, <laughs> no. So I think what would happen would be that there would still be the possibility of belonging would always exist. So there's no, I don't think there's ever this attain, because non-belonging isn't something to attain. It's what we already are. So it's not like there, so we are, I, I guess my, my answer would be, we've already attained what you're, you think we might attain, like, but it's, it's not a belonging. It's, and I, 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 this is a question, it's related to what you said about the end of Heather's. Like, is she just instituting a new kind of form? And I think we went back and forth on this. I think not because I think she's, it, because she's affirming this figure that doesn't belong and herself as non-belonging, there's, I think what happens is there's a fundamental reshaping of the terrain that occurs, but it doesn't mean, I mean, we don't see what happens in the, and this is tied to the end of Breakfast Club too. We don't see any kind of reorientation. And I think that that's because, I think we don't on purpose because what we see is just this, the ability of non-belonging to just exist as non-belonging. And I think it, I think it can be sustained as that without, I mean, I think what the question is suggesting is doesn't a new kind of belonging form, but I don't think it has to. I guess that would be 
that'd be that'd be where I'd want to end it. I, th I think your your theory is actually suggesting that non belonging is not a teleological kind of concept, and and I think that's a that's possibly a good note to end up on. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Anthony wants to wants to come in and and say something else, um, but um, if not. Uh, we didn't have time, unfortunately, I'm just mindful of the time, it's, uh, oh, it's already one minute past eight o'clock, so we didn't have time to address all questions, but I think they're going to remain uh, in the chat, so um, if people want to engage further, that is always an option, and um, Todd, thank you so much, I really, I really enjoyed this conversation, I think the uh, the audience was also brilliant in, in bringing in some of the really interesting questions and yeah. aspects of, of the question of non-belonging and identity politics. I agree. Thank you so much for your questions. This is great. Thank you. No, wor no worries at all. And I, I look forward to the to continuing the discussion. Uh, for our audience, uh, do uh, make sure you, you read Todd's essay. Uh, it's uh, very informative. Um, buy the book as well um etc cetera, etc cetera. and i actually have some if you want i have the pdf so if you want to email me you can i'll send you the pdf so I, if you don't want to spend your money on it if, if you don't want to spend your money on the commodity form that's right uh, and participate yeah. in the alienation of intellectual and academic labor yeah. there you go okay um i think we do need to wind up now so um thanks everyone and todd great speaking to you and uh yes yeah, see you all hopefully at tomorrow's event as well bye bye, bye.